awesome. Thank you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for making us a family. Thank you for the opportunity to connect today with you and with one another. Thank you for the love that we get to share with one another because of what your son Jesus has done for us, that you so love the world that you sent him to pay the price for our sin, and we thank you for that today. Pray that we would be ambassadors of your love today. Pray that you would prepare our hearts as we worship you now, that you'd begin to work in us in such a way that we'd be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way in us. Have your way in this place. I pray that you draw all hearts to a greater knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior. We thank you for this, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Let's clap to the Lord. He's worthy. You're worthy, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus.
I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opens up the
your freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers and I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the Father, we surrender to you today. And Lord, I thank you that you are unchanging, immovable. And Lord, we ask for your perspective today. Whatever circumstance you are facing, whatever situation that you are in, know that the Lord desires that we have the mind of Christ that we take his perspective, not our own. So, Father, we look to you today. Our confidence is in you, Father. Our trust is in you. We fully rely upon you, God, without fear. I want to read to you from Isaiah 41 today says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of my Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant, I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In verse 13, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Thank you for your word today.
He reigns in the middle of your circumstances. He reigns over your family. Sing it again. He reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you today, God, for being so good. Lord, we confess your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord God, for everything that you have done for us and everything that you stand ready to do, we give you praise. We thank you today. Lord, we pray that your goodness as it's poured out on us, that it would be shown through us to a world that needs to know you, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would make yourself evident here today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, before you sit down today, I want you to take some time, share God's love with the people around you, greet each other, high fives, holy hugs, bless one another. God is good, amen? All the time. I'm going to um, share a message with you today that kind of works in conjunction with last week's message. So I won't re-preach last week's message, but I will refer to some things that we talked about as a platform for building on that today. And in case I forget to tell you, this message is entitled, Faith That Works. Faith that works. Last week we talked about how to deal with a troubled heart. Okay? And I gave you three points. Today's message is going to be a little bit different because I'm not going to give you three points. I like to do that. Not that every time I give you three points, those three points will all apply to you, but hopefully at least one of them will. But I want to preach to you in, in such a way today that you walk away with a big idea. Now, when I get done, you might say, What's the big idea, Pastor? You preached for 47. Don't worry about that. God has something in mind for you today, okay? So last week we talked about how to deal with a troubled heart, and the way that we do that is begin by believing what Jesus said, amen? 
Maybe you're going through something right now that would cause your heart to feel troubled. I believe that God has a specific word for you that he can take something that Jesus said that's written in the word and impart it to your heart right now. He wants us to believe in what Jesus has said. Next, he wants us to believe in what Jesus has done. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? The price that he paid, right? And sometimes way back then we put our faith in that or we carry that around in our minds, but God wants the knowledge of what Jesus has done for us to be present in our hearts. He wants it there right now. Finally, God wants us to believe in what Jesus is doing. Jesus' work on the cross is finished, but he is still interceding for us by presenting us as holy unto God. When we hear about the word intercession, our minds may first think of prayer, and prayer is a form of intercession. But in Christ's intercession, he presents us to God, he represents us before God, he acts as a mediator for us unto God, he, like a, like a go-between, hallelujah. And because of that, God accepts us and loves us just as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. I have some scriptures to read to you, several scriptures today. It's almost going to be like doing a sword drill, so get your Bibles ready. If you don't have your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we want to give you one. If you don't have your Bible with you, it's okay. We'll have uh, the scriptures up here on the screen for you. So the first one is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. I'm so thankful to be a New Testament believer that 2,000 some odd years on the other side of Jesus' death, I get to look back at everything that God said in the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. And to know at the right time, Jesus suffered and died paid the price for my sins so that he might become a mediator for me unto God. The next verse is Colossians chapter 1, verses 22, and then also just through the first part of 23. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Let me ask you this morning, are you continuing in your faith? I believe that God wants us to continue in our faith and to go from faith to faith and to experience a growth in our faith as we grow in him. So last week we talked about faith, or another word for faith is belief. And I shared with you that according to the Bible, it is impossible to live in sin and to operate in faith. You can't do it. You, you living a sinful life will compromise the faith that you have in Christ and your ability to act in faith. Now, I'm not just making that up. We looked at this verse last week, but again, we're laying a foundation for today's message. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says this, see to it, brothers and sisters. We're talking to believers, not unbelievers. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful or that none of you develops a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That's what a sinful heart does. It's, it's cause and effect. When you begin to sin, when you become sinful in your heart, when you embrace sin as a lifestyle, what's going to happen is it's going to violate the faith that's inside of you. You're going to develop an unbelieving heart, and it's out of an unbelieving heart that people start to turn away from God. They may know a truth about God up here, but because the enemy is tempting them and leading them into a lifestyle of sin, they're saying yes to the world and no to Jesus. It's, it, may, it may be that they don't want to give away that faith, but it's like sin comes in and that's what it does. It compromises our relationship with God and then unbelief sets in and it's when unbelief sets in that that heart begins to turn away. How do we keep this from happening? Well, if I point back to last week, those three things, we must continue to value highly what Jesus has said, what he has done, and what he's doing for us right now. 
with regard to what Jesus has said. He's given us his word. His word is, a, uh, his word is living and active and powerful, and it's a constant reminder. And it's like the washing of the water with the word and the Holy Spirit is like the soap and the agent that comes in and just says, oh, let's clean this thing up. Let's clean it up from sin. Let's wash away all unbelief. Let's put your heart in a position where you can follow hard after him. Amen. We need the word of God, the living, enduring word of God. Psalms chapter 119, verses 9 through 11. Now, this speaks to young people, but it really speaks to all of us. But I want to say to young people today, you live in a day and an age where the enticement of the world is maybe more prevalent than it's ever been. And all kinds of messages are being flown in your face. Okay, All types of advertisements and sexuality and every other perversion that could take place. The enemy wants to use this stuff to develop in you an unbelieving heart, to compromise your faith, and to lead you away from the living God. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11 says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? How can I keep my heart pure? How, how can I keep my faith intact? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, are you living according to the word? Are you seeking after the Lord? And are you hiding his word in your heart? If you're doing that, you're protecting your heart from sin and unbelief. But if you're not, you are susceptible to regressing in the faith that you once had. Instead of regressing in our faith by developing a sinful and unbelieving heart, God wants us to grow in our faith. God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in our ability to trust him in all kinds of situations. Now, I don't know what it is that you're facing right now, but you're going to face things that you were meant to face so that your faith might be developed and that might, it might learn to persevere. If you've been doing any of the Life Journal readings this last week, you've read through the book of James, and a couple of our central scriptures come from there. James is a wonderful book in the New Testament, a very practical and instructive book. James was written by Jesus, most scholars agree that James was written by Jesus' half-brother, so a son of Mary and Joseph, the brother James, James who became uh, really kind of the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. He writes this, but as he writes these words, he doesn't point to his relationship with Jesus as a half-brother. He points to faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus that recognizes us in him and adjoins us to him. Let's look at James chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you know that God doesn't want you to lack anything? We're going to read some more verses about how God doesn't want you to lack anything, about how he provides us with everything that we need. But in order for us to get what we need, what, sometimes what we need, we need the word, right? Faith comes from hearing. The power of the gospel is this, that within it is it's the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. So when that is shared and somebody receives it and believes on it, they can be saved, okay? So that's the beginning of faith. But then sometimes faith will need to be tested. It will need to be tried. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt 
because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive any, anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. God wants our prayer life to be an expression of the word that he's giving us and then us proclaiming our promises back to him as we pray, as we trust him. Sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you know, sometimes I'll pray a prayer and it's not necessarily prayed in faith. It's more like I hope, I wish, if it be your will, and it's kind of like just throwing that out, out there into the atmosphere. And say, okay, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it. But I believe that God wants to teach us to pray in a new way. This message isn't even about prayer, so I don't know why the Holy Spirit's leading this. But anyway, he wants us to begin to pray his word, hang on to his word, confess his word, right? And then when we get to a place where there's a trial, a trouble, a hardship, I believe he wants to insert his words into our heart and insert his words into our prayer that we would declare his word and stand and say, I'm going to believe you, Lord. And God's going to help you encounter all kinds of things so that you don't lack anything, so that when your faith encounters this thing, you'll be ready. When your faith encounters this thing, you'll be ready. Get ready. He's getting his church ready. If we don't go through trials... Our faith will not be tested, and we will lack the faith perseverance that God wants us to have. At the same time, God does not want trials to cause our hearts to be troubled. So a lot of our, our faith development is going to come through the Word. It's going to come through exercising the Word in prayer. It's also going to come through testing or facing trials and hardships and learning how to respond to those different situations. How do you handle trials or hardships? Like, if you're like me in the flesh, like, get me out of here. I'm out, right? God, take this away. Calgon, take me away. Life is too hard. I, it's just too hard. It's too overwhelming. I can't help to be this way. I, what do you expect? How do you expect me to feel? So we play the victim card. Remember what Jesus said. We looked at this last week in John chapter, uh, the Gospel of John chapters 14 and 16. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Believe in me and take heart. Have faith, have faith, have faith because I have overcome the world. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, is God for you? Yes! I didn't expect you to say it like that. I just wanted to say that way for you resoundingly yes he is for you this is how for you he is if god is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all okay look at this this is his word how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things He's going to give you all things, right? He's going to give you all things. Well, he hasn't given me a new house. He hasn't given me a new car. He hasn't given me a new job. He hasn't given me a new spouse. He ain't going to give you that. Okay, so what are you talking about here? I'm talking about what Jesus has done for us, that everything we're ever going to need is already laid up in heaven with him. Hallelujah. So while we're here on earth, we don't have to worry about all that stuff. You're going to get it. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get it, and when you get it, it's not going to compromise your faith because you're going to be like him. And down here, instead of pursuing stuff and things and status, we need to be like the young man in Psalm 119, seeking him with all of our hearts, knowing that he has graciously provided us all things. Do we really believe that? I don't know. I don't think I, always, I, don't think I believe that all the time. I don't think I walk around, but I'm, I'm asking, Lord, would you help me walk around with that knowledge so I can have a new level of faith ready at the moment that you bring me to the next trial? I don't want to get to the next trial and, and respond spiritually like somebody just punched me in the face. Boom! I just got sucker punched. Okay? Now I'm back on my heels. 
How am I supposed to respond to this? I want to say, you know what? The, we sang about facing our own giants, right? You remember singing about that this morning? We have our own giants. Well, before David ever faced Goliath, he faced the lion and the bear. And because he faced the lion and the bear, when he came to confront Goliath, he was ready. God will raise up trials and he will raise up things for you to faith so that your faith is ready at the next level to face the next thing. Praise you, God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything. Do, we, do we really believe that? I, I want to believe that with all my heart right now. Everything that we need. This message applies to us not only individually, but it applies to us as a church. Pastor, we need a new parking lot. It's flooded. Pastor, we need a new building. It's breaking down. Pastor, we need a new air conditioning. Well, we might need new air conditioning, right? I told first service, don't sweat it. Okay? God has... God has given us everything that we need right now, everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, thank you, Lord, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Will you get, will you get tired? It's like the enemy runs out of stuff when we get tired of the world. I don't need that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. He runs out of ammunition real quick. He said, I want you, Lord Jesus. And the Lord says, okay, you want me? Seek me with all your heart. Seek me in the word. I've given you everything you need. I got it, raised. I got it ready for you and everything that you need right now. There's not something else that's holding you back. Probably the only thing that's holding us back is us not seeking him with all of our hearts. We begin to seek him with all of our hearts and we recognize everything I need God has given to me right now and that's how I'm going to operate as I face this next situation. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 it says, and without faith it is impossible to please God. God your, God, your heavenly Father, okay, he wants to grow your ability to trust him. So when I say faith, it's your ability to trust him. Can I trust him with this? Can I trust him in this? Can I trust him with this? Whatever that is for you. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly, sincerely, from their hearts, seek him. Thank you, God. He is a rewarder. Praise you, God. God wants us to have a faith that trusts and a faith that perseveres and a faith, this is what we're, we're leading up to, and a faith that acts a faith that works. It works, it acts. Amen? Okay, so now we're going to move to James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, if one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good, that's not the kind of belief that we're talking about. It's not the kind of faith we're talking about today. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Oh, that we might be your friend, dear God. 
You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Real biblical faith does something. It takes action. Listen, I'm not preaching a doctrine of works. I wholeheartedly believe in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's one of my fa- probably my favorite verses. For by grace you are saved through faith. Okay, This is not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works so that nobody can boast. That means nobody can achieve it. God saves the, right, the, the person that appears righteous, the good person, okay, and the person who is sinful by the same thing, by grace, through faith. That grace was manifested in his son, Jesus Christ, and was demonstrated when Jesus went to the cross to lay down his life to take on our sin. There was action that accompanied Jesus' faith. And Jesus wants us to follow his example by being a people that demonstrate our faith in action. It's time for active faith. Active faith. Not just faith that's here, okay? Not just agreement here. Active faith where faith moves us to do something. A faith that is, maybe the Holy Spirit is saying today, I want to move you into the word because you need to grow in faith. And I want to give you some trials and tribulations, but before I give you there to test your faith, I need to get your faith built up in the word. It's time to activate your faith by being in the word. For some of you, you you might have to activate your faith by joining a small group. Saying, ah, that whole relationship thing, yeah. What's the importance? Building relationship, getting getting your life connected with other people. I don't know if I want to be that vulnerable. That's what a family does. You can't be that way with 100 people, but you could be that way with 5, 6, 7, 8, maybe 12, right? In a small group. Maybe God wants you to take another step. So getting into a small group would be leadership, but then getting into leading a small group. (laughs) Pastor. Okay, what are you trying to get me to do? We need more small group leaders. Okay? Maybe you don't consider yourself worthy. Rahab probably didn't either. Okay? And yet God used her based on what he called her to do and what she did. She was proven to be righteous. Hallelujah. We need people that will take a step of faith and start a ministry. We need people... God needs people who in everyday life, when they see the need that they will rise up to meet it, that they will be like the mediator, or I coined this phrase, the neediator, okay? The neediator to step in and to help meet that need. It's time for active faith. So in James chapter 2, obviously Abraham is mentioned here. And in Genesis 22, Abraham is tested when God tells him, I want you to offer your only son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah, and Abraham goes through with it. Now, he doesn't take Isaac's life because the, an angel of the Lord interrupts him, provides a sacrifice there in the thicket on the mount okay, of a ram. But Abraham's heart was in such a place that when tested by God, God he, he responded to God, and, and Hebrews tells us the way he ration, rationalized this in his mind was he would have never been able to do this except he believed that if God called him to take his son's life, that God would raise his son from the dead. Talk about prophetic, right? Because he didn't have to raise Isaac from the dead, but he did raise his son from the dead. Amen. And so Abraham follows through on this, and he was considered righteous because of his willingness to obey God. But we can, we compare, So we compare and contrast. Now we look at Rahab, and in Joshua chapter 2, we see that she takes action to protect the two spies uh, that Joshua sent to spy out Jericho, all right, and and they come into her house, and they're like, oh, this is kind of a dark, seedy movie. And she, nothing bad happens as she provides them coverage, and she allows them to get out, and she puts them through. She, she lives in an apartment that has a hole in the wall, and, she, and a window in the wall, and she allows them to escape. She was a, she was a prostitute, right? 
Why would God put Abraham and Rahab here in the same thing? Because he wants you to recognize that everybody in between is a candidate of faith, to act by faith. You're a candidate to act by faith, right? You know, Rahab, she actually is mentioned in Christ's genealogy. Rahab became the mother of Boaz, okay? And it's just another thing to say, listen, it's, I want to tell you today, it's not your sin that disqualifies you because Jesus has paid the price for your sin. Once he delivers you from it, he doesn't want you to go back to having a sinful and unbelieving heart because it will compromise your faith. It's not a question of sin, it's a question of faith. And God wants us to be a people in a church who begin to activate our faith by doing what he has called us to do with it. And sometimes we're just content to keep our faith to ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, that is not the kind of faith that Jesus died to give you. He died to give you a faith that works, a faith that's in action. And it's not your action that proves your faith. It's basically you begin by putting your faith in Jesus according to what he says in the word and it's action that comes from it. You're saved by grace through faith, but it's a faith that works. Amen? What makes a good person righteous and a bad person righteous is the same thing. It's faith in God and a faith that expresses itself in action. God wants our faith to cause us to take action. Where is God calling you to take action? Where is he calling you to step out? So, you know, almost every time I kind of finish a message or I think I've finished it, I just take time in prayer and I say, Lord, if there's anything I missed, will you speak to me? Will you tell me? And then sometimes God will give me something that's crystal clear. And I, I, I feel like this is what the Lord spoke to my heart during my time of prayer. He just said, stop compromising your faith by not taking action. Stop compromising your faith by not taking action. I think what, ha what happens is, our faith growth is stunted when he brings us to a place where it's time for us to step into faith and to step out and to act and to exercise that faith. And for whatever reason, because we're, I don't know, embarrassed or overwhelmed or whatever, that we take a step back, we start to regress in our faith. And God said to me, stop compromising your faith by not taking action. Activate your faith. Activate your faith. I'm not talking about action for the sake of action. I'm not talking about you getting your resume ready. Oh, you know, I probably need to get this ready so that when I get to heaven, I'd be able to tell Jesus, I did this for you, I did this for you, I did this for you. And, and I have it signed by a notary, okay? doesn't make any difference. I'm not talking about you coming up with all kinds of ideas. I'm talking about you being led by the Holy Spirit when he brings you into the moment and he knows you, he wants you to activate your faith. And that could be as simple as, you know, calling somebody on the phone or stopping to, to pray for somebody or giving somebody something that's in need. But I'm just saying the Holy Spirit wants to begin to activate his church so his church is his hands and feet. Right? And our faith grows talking about having a heart that seeks the Lord and takes action based on the Holy Spirit's leading. What kind of action is God calling you to today? We're going to close with this. What kind of action? Is it action to persevere? Maybe you feel like you've had a trial. Recognize, for what, recognize it for what it is spiritually speaking right now. Trials come to help you learn how to persevere in faith. Okay? And to get you ready for the next trial. So do you need to persevere? Is, it, is, it, is the Lord calling you to an action today? Maybe it's an action like Abraham's where you, he's calling you, I want you to obey, and it's going to cost you because right now you're in love with this thing. I can't think of something that Abraham would have loved more than Isaac for how long he had to wait and to pray and to believe and to trust. Now he had to give that up. Maybe God's wanting you to obey, and maybe he's wanting you to sacrifice something. Say, hey, I don't need this anymore. Maybe God is calling you to the action of protection like Rahab. Okay? He's wanting you to step in and mediate. Something's coming against somebody, and God has given you the ability to do it, and he's saying, yep, it's you. I've called you this. Step in, step out. Action to step out in some area. Action to meet a need or to mediate or go between. Right? I don't know what he's called you to take action in today. Sometimes I believe 
that what God ultimately wants us to take action in is so much bigger than ourselves that he helps us, give, gives us these little trials to get us ready. And I sense that what he wants to do is probably so much bigger than what we might think is possible through us. But he's getting us ready for it. If we'll continue to say, yes, I'm going to take action. You show me, and I'm going to take action. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. If you, um, if you need to take action today to forgive someone, God will help you do that. And I didn't talk about forgiveness, but if you need to take action to forgive, when you forgive, you, you're not coming into agreement with what the person did, that it was right or it was okay. It was probably sin if it hurt you. But when you take that action to forgive, God is wanting to free you and release you. And I think there's at least somebody here today who needs to take that action to pray that prayer, Lord, I'm willing to forgive. And God's going to release you and free you in Jesus' name. There's other action steps that need to be taken, action steps in relationships. So, so Lord, activate my faith. They're not doing what I want them to do, Lord. It's so hard to do what I'm supposed to be doing when they're not doing what I want them to do. Activate your faith today. Do it by faith unto the Lord and see what God does with your faith. Faith works. Faith moves mountains. And if we want to move any mountains, we need to start with some molehills. And say, Lord, I'm going to activate my faith here. I'm going to activate my faith here. I'm going to trust you. God, deliver me from a sinful and unbelieving heart that's enticed by the world and develop me in me a heart that pursues you with everything that I am. Father, I pray that today, that in the midst of our trials, that we'd look at what you are doing to get us ready and that we'd give you praise. Help us to take that next step in faith that works. Help us to take action. Speak to us right now, Holy Spirit, I pray. You're the one who can help us to know what it is, the next thing, the next step to take. So help us to do it now, and we will trust you in the midst of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you to know the altar is open up here for you to come and pray. I want to invite you to do that. If you want to have prayer with somebody, our prayer workers will be over here to pray with you. If you want to go to somebody else who's in here and pray with them or just link up with somebody that's right next to you to pray a prayer of agreement, do that now. Let's continue to do that in this room. God bless you. Have an awesome day.